Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 83. I am just back from the Family History Expo in St. George, Utah, which was fabulous as usual. They had a great turnout, uh, an array of classes, and I had so much fun meeting many of you at my booth in the exhibit hall and, of course, in my classes. Um, I taught the Google classes, parts one and two, on Friday, and then on Saturday morning, we did Google Earth for genealogy. I love that class. I could just see the eyes of my students uh, in the audience getting wider and lighting up as they started to grasp what's really possible um, for their genealogy research with Google Earth. So that was a lot of fun. And I tell you, I must have had a genealogy fairy on my shoulder this weekend because I got into that class, pulled up my PowerPoint presentation, and it was blank. I have no idea what happened. It was everything I could do not to freak out. But (laughs) thankfully, I was debuting my brand new DVD. It's called Google Earth for Genealogy at the expo. And I had a copy in my bag. So I just popped the DVD into my laptop and I winged it. I just played parts of the video that covered uh, my material that I normally do in the presentation and then uh, narrated it live. And it actually worked out really well. It was so much more interactive than just looking at those stagnant PowerPoint slides. So I guess everything worked out for the best. And actually, I I may use that in the future because sometimes you get into a conference hall like that and you don't have internet access. So you have to rely on those um, still slides. But showing it on the video is better because you can see yourself flying to the different locations within Google Earth and really interacting with the program. Now, the Google Earth DVD contains the six videos that are also available as part of premium membership, but I thought it would be kind of nice to have it on DVD so that it's portable and you can keep the videos long term for your future reference. Now, of course, we couldn't cover everything in a one hour class that's on the video, but we certainly got our feet wet with um, we identified old photographs, used street view and historic maps, and of course, talked about plotting our ancestors homesteads. So it was a lot of fun. However, we did sell out of all the DVDs at the conference, so it is going to be a few more weeks before we can offer the DVD for sale on the website. I was hoping to come back and just announce that it was going to be available, but uh, we ran out. So (laughs) if you are interested in the DVD version of the Google Earth videos, stay tuned. Um, They are coming. And of course, you can always become a premium member if you'd like, and then you can get all of the Google Earth videos there as part of your membership. Um, And also, of course, you get the 12-part series on iGoogle and Google Tools. So um, lots of videos there that are part of premium membership. And of course, I add a new video every month. So there's always something new on premium. Now, in the genealogy news, um, Family Tree Magazine just announced its list of top 40 genealogy blogs. Uh, If you haven't checked out genealogy blogs, I think you're missing something because not only can you get some great uh, information just about research, but lots of people out there are blogging about their own family history and their research. And who knows, maybe they are talking about somebody in your family tree. So it's a great way to connect up with other with other people who are researching your family lines. Now, a couple of months ago, Family Tree Magazine opened up nominations for this top 40 list. And it's amazing that they were able to narrow it down to just 40. Because like I said, there are literally hundreds of terrific genealogy blogs out there. Um, my blog and my podcast weren't actually eligible for the list since I do write for the magazine and I produce the Family Tree Magazine podcast. But I did want to say a big thank you to all of you who did vote for my blog, uh, the Genealogy Gems News blog. I very much appreciate that. That was very nice of you. Um, You can find the list in the May 2010 issue of Family Tree Magazine, which just came out. Uh, I just got mine in the mail a couple of days ago. Uh, Or you can visit the website familytreemagazine.com slash article slash fab dash 
40. And check out the list. There are some, if you're not reading blogs yet, it's a great place to start. And uh, then I would encourage you, go to google.com and do a search on perhaps some of your family names and blog, or genealogy blog. See what you come up with. You might find something good. Also, a week or so ago, I did another webinar for Family Tree Magazine. It was called Google Search Tips and Tricks. Of course, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, You've certainly heard many of those tips and tricks here on the podcast and, of course, in the premium video series. But I really do enjoy doing the webinars um, because they're interactive. And uh, I might even be putting together some Genealogy Gems webinars in the future. So um, stay tuned for that in the coming months. Hopefully, we're going to put something like that together. Um, Like I said, I really like doing the webinars because they're live and we can interact with each other right there during the presentation, just like we do in a class setting. Um, But of course, in this case, we can all be at home in our jammies or whatever is comfy uh, all over the country and the world. Um, So this new technology is pretty amazing, very fun, uh, and it's wonderful to be using it for genealogy. Now, of course, the big news this last week has been the premiere of the new genealogy-themed television series, Who Do You Think You Are? Now, by now, you have probably listened to my interview with Lisa Kudrow, who, of course, all of you know from the hit TV series Friends, and she's producing the series and also appears in one of the episodes. In fact, I have been super fortunate to actually receive a DVD of the entire series ahead of time. Um, I know, I'm very lucky. I I don't know why I got so lucky, but it was in preparation for the interview with Lisa. And I have, I got to tell you, I have watched Lisa's episode. I watched it the other day with my daughter. Uh, What could be better than watching genealogy television and holding my wonderful grandson, Davey? I mean... Anyway, I digress, but I have to tell you, we had a wonderful time, but be sure when you watch her episode, you're going to need a box of Kleenex on hand because I cried through a good portion of her episode, um, which is going to run on TV on March 19th. So you have that to look forward to. It's amazing. I mean, my gosh, it's such a harrowing story that they uncover in that episode. Oh, And I watched Matthew Broderick's episode. You know, I didn't realize that his father was um, the actor James Broderick. And I was trying to think where I know him from. He was in the 1970s TV series called Family, as I recall. I think Christy McNichol was the daughter or something. Remember that? Well, anyway, what I really loved about Matthew's episode was how they took the time to not only show the actual documents that they were using along the way, but they really took some time to explain the research process and where they were going to get the records. Um, I really feel like that was something that was missing in the Faces of America series that was on PBS recently. You know, they were so busy covering so many celebrities that I sort of felt like that the research just kind of got thrown under the bus. Um, In fact, I can tell you now um, that it's over, (laughs) that PBS told me that they were going to arrange an interview for me with Henry Louis Gates, because I really wanted to have him on the show and bring him to you and have him talk about Faces of America, uh, which, of course, was on in February of 2010. But in the end, he came back and he said, oh, he was too busy, and we never did the interview. Well, I thought that was really interesting. It was a very interesting choice on his part to kind of do all the standard media outlets, um, like, you know, the Washington Post and that kind of stuff, but then kind of snub, you know, the genealogy media outlets. And that's why I really have to say kudos to Lisa Kudrow for making it a priority and spending, I mean, an entire half an hour with me talking about the show for the podcast. I've seen her on other TV shows. She's been doing kind of a promotional blitz recently on television for Who Do You Think You Are? And, you know, usually you get about a five or 10 minute segment. So the fact that she invested so much time and really shared with us here on the show her experiences was really terrific. And I'm really grateful for that. And, you know, she's not even a genealogist like Henry Gates is. So it was pretty interesting the way that all worked out. Um, interesting choice on his part to to not really reach out to the genealogy community. 
So I hope that you are going to be watching the Who Do You Think You Are series or or setting your DVR or TiVo to record it. If we all get behind this show and we watch it, they're going to have great ratings. And hopefully, that means there's going to be a season two. And certainly, hopefully, a renewed interest in family history across America. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, and a big thank you. Thank you very much to the folks at the Southern California Jamboree for blogging about my interview with Lisa Kudrow. I really appreciate you guys getting the word out about the podcast. Uh, and I can't wait to for this year's Jamboree. It's going to be in June in Burbank, California. Always a great event. And speaking of conferences... I will be speaking at the Ontario Genealogical Society Conference that's coming up in May of 2010 in Toronto, Canada. And I just got an email from them saying that March 15th, it's just about a week away, it's the last day to take advantage of their early bird registration rates. So you can browse the program uh, and check out the speaker pages online. Make a note of the sessions that you're interested in, and you can even print out their little handy daily schedules. So if you're interested, go to torontofamilyhistory.org slash 2010. Just click on the How Do I Register link and select the registration package that suits you best. Um, Then you can just follow their secure online registration form, and it's going to guide you through that whole registration process. I am really looking forward to this conference because I've never been before, and because I get the chance to meet a lot of you. Not just Canadian listeners, because I know that this conference gets folks from all over, but I am looking forward to uh, getting up into Canada and visiting with you guys. So I hope to see you there. And finally, while I was at the Family History Expo in St. George, Utah, uh, this was February of 2010, Generation Maps announced the release date for their brand new Family Chartist program on their website at generationmaps.com. Generation Maps has been producing family tree charts for years, but now they have a brand new website that will help you quickly and easily create really gorgeous custom genealogy charts. I was lucky enough to have Janet Havorka, who's the owner of Generation Maps, kind of give me a personal tour of Family Chartist while I was at the expo, and it was amazing. Uh, You can try it out for yourself starting March 8th, which may actually be the day that this episode gets published. So go check it out today, generationmaps.com. Click on Family Chartist, and hopefully, I've got my fingers crossed, Janet is going to be joining us here on the podcast very soon in an upcoming episode to tell us more about it and how to make the most of it. You know, I'm always talking about how important it is to take the time to share your research in ways that will be meaningful to the non-genealogists in your family. And I got to tell you, these charts are fantastic, and it's a wonderful visual way to do just that. Well, I think that's it from here. So now it's time to hear from you, and we're going to do that at the mailbox. Bring me a letter from my old hometown. One with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown. Bring me a letter from that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me all the time Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I bet he's glad But more than any other From my hometown Ah, my email box has been hopping these days. Lots of great letters, emails, postings from you guys. Um, here's an email from Marion Vermazen, who writes, Lisa. I enjoy listening to your podcast, and I just have to figure out how to create a list of things to do when I'm driving and you trigger an idea. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's, that's a good idea. Be careful while you're driving. You know, here in California, they won't even let us use our cell phone anymore when we're driving. Um, but there you go. I'm glad I can spend some time with you in the car, Marion. Uh, Marion says, I have a couple of quick questions. I use Family Tree Maker, and I'm thinking of switching to Roots Magic. I know they are a sponsor of your show, but would you recommend changing? In an early show, I think you said that Ancestry doesn't handle sources very well. Has that changed? Do you think Roots Magic makes entering and keeping track of sources easy? I've downloaded the trial version of Roots Magic and used a GEDCOM file to transfer my data. It looks like I will lose my media and sources if I switch, but I find Family Tree Maker rather cumbersome. I'd be interested in your recommendations. And her second question is, what do you think is the best tool for reading up on how to correctly cite sources? Also, I'm thinking about becoming a premium member. Well, thank you, Marion. That is great. And Marion Marian has listed here. She has a blog. It's marionvermazen.blogs.com. I will have that on the show notes for this episode. Um, let's see. Now, I got in touch with our sponsor, Bruce Busby, who is the president of Roots Magic, and I asked him about your questions. He said that it really depends on which version of Family Tree Maker that you use. If it's Family Tree Maker 2006 or earlier, you don't lose anything, sources or media, if you do the direct Family Tree Maker import um, to Roots Magic. If it's Family Tree Maker 2008 or later, Bruce says that Roots Magic doesn't have a direct import and Family Tree Maker doesn't export the media links to GEDCOM. So you could lose the media links in that case. But he assured me that you should never lose the sources, either via direct import or GEDCOM. So that's not really a concern. Um, And yes, personally, I mean, in all honesty, I really do feel like Entering sources into Roots Magic, it's it really is easy. I love it. I'm absolutely committed to it. It's such a critical part of what we do in our research. And I think that you're going to find that it it's it does a beautiful job of doing that for you. Now, you asked about the best tool for reading up on how to correctly cite sources. Uh, great question. I would recommend Elizabeth Schoen Mill's book. It's called Evidence Explained. Uh, It's really a standard in the genealogy community. So I'm going to have a link for you to the book in Amazon.com in the show notes for this episode. And of course, as always, when you use the links that are on our website uh, to do your shopping, say in Amazon or some of the other items that we talk about here on the show, you are actually supporting the podcast at the same time. So uh, that's true for any of you. And I really do appreciate that that all of you do use the links on the website. That is wonderful. Keeps the free podcast going. Okay, Carol Purinton. Oh, Carol, I hope I got that right. Purinton. She wrote in, she says, I just signed up for the Genealogy Gems newsletter. That's our email newsletter. And I received the Google search document. That's the free ebook that you get when you sign up for the e-newsletter. She says, I thought I knew most of the filters available via Google, but evidently not. Thank you for providing this helpful document. Oh, you're very welcome. (laughs) Glad to do it. She says, I think I'm in the market for a new MP3 player. I bought a Creative Zen player last year. Hmm, I have never heard of that. Creative Zen. It's an MP3 player. And she says, and then I bought a new PC, and Creative Zen says that they don't have Vista drivers for that player. Nice. Not considering that I only used it for a few months. Do you have a recommendation? I listen to podcasts and audiobooks more than I listen to music. Well, Carol, I will have a link for you in the show notes for this episode, which is, of course, 83. And it takes you to a website that does a comparison of the higher-end MP3 players so that you can really see what your options are and what you're getting depending on which player you're choosing. Um, It's a great little kind of review website. And for those of you who are new to the podcast, to get to the show notes that I keep referring to, just go to genealogygems.tv. Click the word podcast in the menu that you'll find that on the left hand side of the page. Click season five, which is episodes 81 through through 100 and scroll down to episode number 83 or whichever episode it is that you're looking for. You just click the link for that episode and it takes you directly to the show notes 
um, for the web page that goes along with the episode that you're listening to. So there I'm going to have all the links, the photographs, that kind of stuff, all that information. Um, let's see here. You know, personally, Carol, I love my iTouch. Um, the iTouch is basically an iPhone without the phone. Uh, I don't have the the plan that goes with the phone and all that kind of stuff. I just wanted the iTouch, and um, I love it because you can include all the apps on it that you can normally include on the iPhone, um, including the Genealogy Gems podcast app. Uh, you can put that on the iTouch. And if you don't want to spend as much money, um, certainly any basic MP3 player can handle podcasts and uh, audiobooks. But if you're like me and you have a lot of episodes on your MP3 player, um, storage space is really the biggest factor. So if you're shopping around and, and you tend to have a lot of episodes, a lot of books on tape, that kind of thing, um, you'll definitely want to shop for one that has a larger capacity. And as far as sound goes, I think the way to upgrade your sound is really to invest in higher end earphones, um, if that's important to you as well. So that's just a couple ideas. But I got to tell you, I love my iTouch. It's great. And I love it because I was in, even though I don't normally use it with the internet, um, I can use it with my wireless internet in the house. And also, like I was traveling and I was in the airport, I was able to tap into the airport internet and use it as well. So so pretty much it's that it's that phone feature that I really don't use much, but it works great for podcasts and for um, books on tape and for audiobooks. Okay, and Kathy Wood Owens posted a request on my Facebook wall. Uh, to find me on Facebook, it's real easy. Just go to Facebook.com. You can search for Lisa Louise Cook and add me as a friend. Uh, to get your own account, it only takes an email address, so it's very simple. And I also include a link to my Facebook page um, in the e-newsletter, as well as there's a button for it on the Genealogy Gems toolbar. And I hope while you're there, if you do join Facebook, which it seems like a ton of genealogists are doing that, um, there is a Genealogy Gems podcast fan page. So do a quick search on Genealogy Gems podcast and become a fan, and then you can kind of keep up with all the updates there on Facebook. Oh, my gosh. So many ways to keep track, huh? Anyway, Kathy writes, on the Genealogy Gems toolbar, can I add new websites for to search? I'd like to add newfamilysearch.org. Thanks for all you do. Well, Kathy, your wish is my command, and I have added new family search to the Genealogy Sites button. So all you have to do is click the down arrow next to the button. Now, that button used to look like a treasure chest, but I thought it was kind of hard to discern what it was. So I made it simple. Uh, the button is now a tree. Makes sense, family tree. So just click that right, the button to the right of the tree. The list will drop down and you will see that new family search is now part of uh, my recommended genealogy list. Great suggestion. Thanks so much for posting that on Facebook. And of course, um, if you haven't downloaded the free toolbar yet, just go to the genealogy gems podcast dot rtoolbar.com and click the download button. It's really quick and easy to download. And of course, the best part is that you can listen to any of my podcasts right there from the toolbar, which frankly, I actually think is an easier way to listen than listening from the website or from iTunes. iTunes isn't always that user friendly. And um, this way you can listen no matter where you're surfing on the, on the web because you don't have to stay put on the website. And if you'd like to see something added to it, uh, let me know. Send me a message like Kathy did, and I will see what I can do. Okay, Jean Pereira wrote in about who do you think you are. She says, I just finished listening to your interview with Lisa Kudrow in episode 81. Great interview. I was interested in hearing what Lisa had to say about the process and her experiences as she investigated her family history. Just enough information to make me curious about what we will find in the series. I've watched two of the four episodes of Faces of America. The others are TiVo'd as I wanted to watch the Olympics and save the other shows for later. I've enjoyed the two shows I saw and I look forward to the remaining two. I'm sorry they didn't receive as much publicity as Who Do You Think You Are has. Perhaps that was because they're on PBS and didn't have a major sponsor like Ancestry pushing and paying for some of the publicity. I hope they come out on DVD so that those who didn't see the series can rent it if they're interested. Well, Jean, uh, now you know from listening to the show a little bit more about the publicity situation. Uh, it wasn't for lack of trying, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, you know, you can't interview somebody if they're not available. 
But the good news is you can watch those episodes of Faces of America for free on the PBS website. So um, just go to pbs.org and navigate to Faces of America. And that's great because then if people come along later and they get interested in genealogy, they can check it out and watch the show uh, down the road. Jean continues, the more we can support shows of this nature and quality, the better in my estimation. They make history come alive, and as Lisa said, gives me an appreciation for what my ancestors endured. I like to think I have benefited from their sacrifices, and it has helped make me the person I am. As always, thanks for your informative podcast. I can hear the smile in your voice, and your enthusiasm is catching. Keep it up. Thank you, Jean. I appreciate it. It is very easy to smile when you get to talk about genealogy, that's for sure. And uh, let's see, we have Kevin Ryan. He dropped me a line on Facebook asking about getting started with British research. He writes, first, love the toolbar. It's great. Do you know anything about research in England? What kind of records are out there? I know the parish and the church where my ancestors lived and got married. I just got a copy of their marriage records. What do I do now? Any help would be great. Kevin Ryan. P.S. Love the podcast. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Uh, I definitely have experience with research in England since my husband's family uh, is all from there. So here are a couple of websites to get you started. First off, uh, free websites. There's the National Archives in the UK. That's at nationalarchives.gov.uk. And also, they have a terrific website called Genuki. It's at G-E-N-U-K-I dot org dot U-K. That website is free, and it's a lot like U.S. Gen Web here in the U.S. Um, you can search, you search by county. It's all organized by county, as much of the records are. And you click on the county, and you'll find lots of volunteers and people putting information up there, um, giving you directions on where to locate you know, newspapers and w- whatever is available in that particular county. People tend to come together and make that information available. Um, so that is a terrific place to start. And, of course, there's the paid websites, such as findmypast.com, which specializes in British records. And, of course, ancestry.com has a great British collection. Um, You know, there are definitely some similarities between British research and researching in the U.S., which is where I know you're located. England, of course, has civil and church, birth, marriage, and death records, um, as well as census records. And you'd you'd find census records on Ancestry and Find My Past. Now, those range from 1841 to 1911. Their privacy laws are a little more strict than here in the U.S., so they don't come up as recent as 1930 like we have, but you can go from 1841 to 1911 and uh, certainly make a lot of progress with those. So just follow the same good genealogy research principles that you have and check out those sites, and that should get the ball rolling. And Nancy wrote in about the two-part hard drive organization video series that's part of premium membership. She says, I watched your two videos on hard drive organization. Most of my files are set up that way, but I fixed a few to make them more like your recommendation. Are you going to do a hard drive organization part three? She says she'd like to see more about uh, where to put things like charts genealogy society info, research trip materials, timelines, and forms. And she asks, why aren't timelines filed under the surname families, like under each grandparent, parent, or under a spouse's name in their surname file? Well, Nancy, um, the reason I didn't do the timelines that way is because I was really thinking of more along the lines of generic historic timelines. But certainly, if you have customized a timeline for a particular ancestor or a family line, then yeah, it would make perfect sense to file those by surname as well. Um, And Nancy is talking about these videos that we do on the premium website. Um, I've been using this system that I kind of developed for at least 10 years now. Um, And I have to tell you, I have never lost a document on my computer. I I can say that, and I'm very pleased to be able to say that. Because that's such a key part of our research. We're working so hard to locate these records and then we go to save them to our hard drive. And of course, the, the big question is, oh my gosh, where am I going to put it so I can find it again? And then where did I put that record? Um, and of course, sources are such an important part of the work that we're doing. And these records are our sources. So this two-part series really does show you step-by-step how to lay all of that out uh, in a way that I guarantee it will work for you. 
It has certainly uh, covered me many times <laughs> when I've gone uh, looking to retrieve records from my hard drive. So, yeah, I guess I will. I'll think about a part three. That makes sense. We can talk about some of those um, extraneous items that you mentioned. And um, I will put part three of the hard drive organization on my to-do list for the premium videos. That's a great idea. Thank you. And finally, Susan Kunkel in Wisconsin wrote in. She says, I work at the Family History Center in Brookfield, Wisconsin. I'm currently teaching our consultants how to use Roots Magic 4 in an effort to transfer their huge path files onto New Family Search. I've been looking at different information regarding the upcoming NBC show, Who Do You Think You Are?, and came across this page. I guess she's talking about the Genealogy Gems website. She says, I'm very interested in learning new searching tools to help our staff and patrons without paying the high cost of conferences. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Sue Conkle. Well, Sue, I am so glad that you discovered the podcast. I really love being able to bring genealogy experts to the show. Um, that's what I do when I go to these conferences. I'm not only teaching and doing the booth, but I'm running around and trying to do interviews with other experts on, on their particular areas of expertise in genealogy. And they are all so generous in sharing their knowledge. It's, it's really incredible. So I guess uh, we could consider the podcast kind of a virtual online conference. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, we will certainly be bringing those experts to you throughout the year. So Susan, thank you so much for writing. Profile America, Saturday, March 6th. The National Census, beginning the first of next month, will be the 23rd time this once-a-decade count has been conducted since 1790. The fifth census in 1830 profiled a quickly expanding nation, counting nearly 13 million residents, an increase of more than one-third in just 10 years. New York remained the largest city, while second and third places were a near tie between Baltimore and Philadelphia. Among the ten biggest cities were Charleston, South Carolina, and Albany, New York. In the decade to follow, Cyrus McCormick invented the Grain Reaper, opening huge sections of the Great Plains to agriculture, and Texas declared its independence from Mexico. You can learn more about the census in U.S. history online at 2010census.gov. When listener Deborah Miller Tossey wrote in looking for advice on preserving newspaper clippings, it struck a chord with me because I inherited a cigar box full of them from my dad's mother. In addition to a variety of clippings that have been given to me or that I've discovered in old family scrapbooks. In fact, I'm pretty sure that just about every one of you out there listening at some point is going to be faced with how to preserve newspaper. So I thought it was worth devoting an entire segment to the challenges of caring for our heritage on paper. So let me start by reading Deborah's email to you. She writes, I was just given a box of old photo albums that belonged to my grandmother and great-grandmother. As I was leafing through the albums, several miscellaneous pieces of paper were among them. Several were obituaries from the newspaper. These were so valuable because, of course, as you know, it links families together by listing mother, father, siblings, and in some cases tells where they may have come from over to our country. It would list their op occupation and how they might have died. I would like to attach these onto several sheets and stick them in sheet protectors so they don't have to be handled when I'm going through them. So my question is, how can I best preserve them so that they will carry on in the family? I love your podcast. They are so informative and helpful. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Lisa. 
Well, thank you, Deborah. And it's a great question. And I've got some great answers for you from my friend Sally Jacobs, the Practical Archivist, who you'll find at practicalarchivist.com. So many of us at some point come across those newspaper clippings, you know, and yeah. what do we do? How, and how do we decide whether you keep those old crumbling clippings? Do you preserve them as they are or do you somehow recreate them and, and toss the original? What do you think? Right. Well, there's definitely two ways to approach it. The first I think everyone knows this because we experience it all the time, but right, newsprint paper is very bad paper. It's highly acidic. Um, it's very inexpensive, and it changes. You know, you can almost see the changes. Like if you leave a newspaper in your car in the sun, the sun accelerates that aging process, and it will yellow pretty quickly. Yeah, so absolutely. We all understand, right, that newspaper is bad. One of the trickiest things about it, though, is not only is it bad in its own integrity, right? It loses its structure, it becomes brittle, it darkens in color, but the acids that are in that clipping can actually leach onto anything else that's in contact with it. So um, you certainly wouldn't want to leave a newspaper clipping in a photo album right up against the photo print because that acid is like a slow fire and it's going to eat right. right into that print. But as far as how to preserve newspaper and how to treat it, the first question you need to ask is really, you know, what is the value of this paper? Is it the information it contains or is it valuable as an artifact itself as an object, right? And the reason why you want to think about it that way is that will change what preservation course you decide to take. If it, I think in the case of this question in particular, it seems like, you know, the, what she really wants to survive is this information, right? This really handy all in one place, right? Family lineage yeah. information, you know, or, you know, and what I would recommend is just reformatting, right? Which means taking that information off of that horrible paper and putting it onto really good paper. And it's a super simple technique. It's used in every repository I've ever worked in, and that's to photocopy it onto archival bond paper. Oh, yeah, okay. white copy, all the information is there. You can tell that it was a clipping, right? In many cases, you know, when you photocopy it, you actually will get a border around it so you can see how it was cut out. And then you've got a standard size, 8.5 by 11 sheet that's, easy to put in sheet protectors, or you can even just three-hole punch it, put it right in a binder. Now, do we have to worry about the kind of ink that's going onto it, or is the critical part the type of paper that it is? Uh, the paper is the critical part because that's how you're going to avoid the, the acid problem again. Okay. Right? So it really starts the clock over, which is nice. So now, if, if it's really the content of the information, getting it onto this archival safe paper is the way to go. But as you said, it could also in itself be a bit of an artifact to us. What if we want to keep that original clipping? Right. And I have to say, Lisa, when you said cigar box handed down to me, I sort of had one of those little like, oh, yeah, see, that's different. <laughs> because it's a whole, you know what I mean? Like I could picture it. I could, you know. Yeah. You knew the hand that had cut those out. Right, and I yes. think that, that makes a certain amount of difference, and I think that that does imbue it with a sentimental value that really can't be measured. So, mm -hmm. what are you going to do if you want to keep the bad paper? You know, what are you going to do? There are treatments available. Every major archival supplier sells sprays and liquids, and there are sort of DIY home methods for soaking things. And what those do is they try and slow it down, right? None of those treatments, no matter how expensive or fancy it is, no matter where you buy it from, none of those treatments is going to repair the structural damage that's taken place. And in some cases, these treatments will actually even darken it more. Because yeah. I know a lot of them are kind of wet. You know, they're, they're, they seem to be water-based. And it always mm -hmm. seemed to me, if I start spraying that on that paper, it's just going to dissolve. <laughs> right. Well, you know, the, the trick is not to use so much that it becomes really, really wet. It's just a little bit yeah. damp. You know, the more newspaper that you're actually talking about, the more impractical it becomes to do that sort of thing. And again, my main point is, if you want to go ahead and do that, go ahead. But don't have false expectations about what you're going to get when you buy that magic bottle of magic spray. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, generally, what I would recommend um, is that you encapsulate it. Now, this is different from laminating. This is not a process that uses heat and glue to fuse a plastic cover onto the original. You don't want to do that. And in fact, with newspapers, because they are so acidic and they give off so much acid, you 
kind of don't want to encapsulate, encapsulate it on all four sides anyway. So what you would want to start with is a clear, um, inert plastic folder. Generally, that means polypropylene and polyester. And there are ones that are closed on three sides. That's what I would recommend. But you don't want to put just the clipping in there. You want to put a piece of good, acidic, buffered paper in there. And what the buffered paper does is it will take that acid hit because the buffered paper has an alkaline uh, quality to it, meaning it starts on the other end of the pH scale. So even when it takes on acid, it's not going to become acidic itself for quite a while. That way you've got the real thing. People won't handle it, you know, and even if it's crumbling, if you've, well, if it's actually starting to break into pieces, then you do need to encapsulate it because the static charge, when that's closed up, will keep those pieces together. Oh, okay. Structural integrity. But generally speaking, I don't think anything that elaborate is necessary, but you don't want, you want to make sure you keep the clippings away from other materials for sure. That's the most important thing. Do we need to be um, thinking in terms at all of attaching that clipping to that bonded paper or just laying it up against it and closing it up? You could do it either way. You could sort of cut, tuck it down in a quarter. If you wanted to be more efficient about how you're storing these, you know, it depends. It's sort of funny to talk about, you know, one of the golden rules of preservation is don't do anything you can't undo. So if you glued down the newspaper, you would sort of be adding another layer of complication. You know, I'm not sure photo corners would work for clippings because the right. paper itself is so thin to start with and it's generally speaking pretty brittle. And that all depends on the size, right? One of the one of the other advantages of the photocopying method, not only can it handle, you know, a large amount of items, but you can actually put multiple clippings onto one sheet and you can Xerox on both sides. Exactly. You okay. You get a lot of clippings into a small binder using that method. But you lose, you know, the artifactual, sentimental part of it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, great suggestion. So we really have to make that decision about whether it's an artifact or whether it's just the information, and then from there can make the decision as to whether to convert it into, uh, you know, a copy, as you said, on the, on the bond paper, or to uh, encapsulate it or, or get it into one of those sleeves. Do you have any recommendations on where we might find the type of sleeve that you're talking about that's archival if we wanted to hang on to that clipping itself? Sure. I would recommend, um, well, archival suppliers that I use pretty often are Uh gaylord.com. There's Hollinger, H-O-L-L-I-N-G-E-R, and another company called Metal Edge have merged. So now they are Hollinger slash Metal Edge. And actually, um, Metal Edge at least this was true a while ago, I haven't checked in a while, was uh, one of the few suppliers where you could buy an encapsulation kit. And let me just explain really briefly what that is. So as I said, encapsulation is different from lamination, right? With encapsulation, you have two sheets of neutral plastic, and you have double-sided tape. And so you put a frame, basically, of double-sided tape outside the perimeter of how big the sheet itself is. Right? So the double-sided tape only touches the plastic sheet that never touches what you're encapsulating. And what you're encapsulating right. floats in the middle. And since it's tape and since there's a border between the end of the tape and the beginning of the object, it's very easy in the future, if you ever need to, to simply slice it open. But when it's not uh-huh. sliced open, it, you know, you can hold it up. For something that's thin and pretty fragile, it actually offers quite a lot of uh, stability and rigidity. So my point is that uh, Metal Edge, at least in the past, used to have uh, kits. Like there would be one that's 8 by 10 size and one that's 5 by 7 size. And basically they've already put the double-sided tape all the way around but left one side closed. Do you know what I mean? Right. So you just have to pull yes. off the tape, put your object in there, and put the second one down. Oh, wonderful. I know. I think that's, that's, that's for people like me who are uh, <clears throat> challenged when it comes to things like laying tape straight. <laughs> Well, great. You've given us some uh, uh, some good options that she can use, and, and I think all of us at some point will be faced with the same dilemma. Um, now, Sally, I know that you're the practical archivist, and I've seen that you recently launched a new web page. So tell us real quick where we can find you online and what you've got going on there at your website. Absolutely. Uh, I, you can now find me at practicalarchivist.com. Uh, I, I started my blog on Blogspot, which was wonderful, and I loved it, but I really wanted to bring it into my own control. And it's finally made that happen. So 
you can find information there. Um, all the articles that I wrote previously have been sucked into the new site. <laughs> so in the blog category, you can read lots and lots of articles. Um, you know, talking about organizing photos, preserving family treasures, and also sharing them. And coming up this spring, probably won't have something that would happen in March, but I think it might be more like April. I'm starting a new uh, teleclass, and there's going to be some other web-based support stuff for people who are taking on a large photo organizing project. Oh, wonderful. Now, I know that of, yeah. they're going to want to sign up for your e-newsletter to get the scoop on that. And um, I know that you get the e-book, the eight blunders that people make when they scan photos and how to avoid them all. That's that's wonderful in itself just to sign up for. But uh, if, if they go to your website and sign up for the newsletter, they'll get that ebook, and then they'll get the notification on these um, teleclasses that are coming up? Absolutely. And, well, to complicate things a little further, I am going to be moving my newsletter host in the next few weeks. But anyone who signs up now and the, the sign up, when you're on the practicalarchivist.com main web page huh? um, or any of the blog pages, the, um, the link to sign up for the newsletter is in the bottom right corner. Okay. Um, and yes, yeah, so if they sign up for um, now, they'll get the Eight Blunders ebook as a thank you, and they will um, get notice when the new courses come out. And as like you said, you've got some great articles there that you've written in the past. So I highly recommend the practicalarchivist.com. Uh, if you have questions about archiving, um, Sally's got a lot of the answers there on her website. Sally, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out and uh, answering a great question that I think is going to help us all in the future. Oh, it's my pleasure, Lisa. I got a great email from listener Gail Hamilton, and I thought it deserved its own gem segment. Gail writes, I enjoy listening to your podcast, and thank you for including information from Mac users, too. Love my Mac. I just wanted to share a poem with you that was recited at my mother-in-law's funeral recently. Maybe you've heard this before, but I think it portrays just what we're trying to do when we construct our family history. It's not just the dates we seek, but to try to put the life and the personality of each ancestor into its rightful place in our history. I found it to be a gem, and I have included it at the beginning of each of my family history books. I hope you find it to be a gem also. Well, I certainly do think it's a gem, Gail. And here's my rendition of the poem that Gail sent me that's called How to Live Your Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood up to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on her tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following dates with tears, but said what mattered most was the dash between those years. From that dash represents all the time that she had spent alive on earth. And now only the ones who loved her know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters most is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about it long and hard. Are there things you would like to change? You never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If you could just slow down enough to consider what is true and real and try to understand the way other people feel. Be less quick to anger. Show appreciation more. Love the people in our lives like we've never loved them before. Treat others with respect and, more often, wear a smile. Remembering this special dash might only last a while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? Profile America, Thursday, March 11th. 
A devastating public health crisis began in the U.S. on this day 92 years ago and has been mentioned often in discussions about the H1N1 virus scare of recent months. The disease was called the Spanish Influenza and first hit soldiers at Fort Riley, Kansas, just back from fighting in Europe. The virus moved quickly and in October of 1918, 195,000 Americans perished. In one day alone, 851 New Yorkers died. By 1920, nearly one in four Americans had suffered from this strain of the flu, killing a half million of them. But even less dramatic forms of the disease are deadly. Each year, more than 56,000 Americans die of the flu and pneumonia. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau conducting the 2010 census beginning April 1st. Well, that's it for this episode number 83 of the Genealogy Gems podcast. It's sponsored by Roots Magic. Uh, head to genealogygems.tv and click on the Roots Magic sponsor icon to go over to their site, let them know that you came from Genealogy Gems, and check out, of course, their new Roots Magic Essentials. It's a free download, wonderful way to give it a trial run, but I guarantee you're going to love it. So you're going to want to get Roots Magic 4. The most current version, uh, it is packed full of so many of the great features that people have been asking for. And I believe that particular version was essentially a complete rewrite. I mean, so much is changing, isn't it? So quickly in the genealogy industry. And Roots Magic stays right on top of it. It's a terrific program. And there's a whole suite of programs there to check out at Roots Magic. If you, again, would like information about the things we've talked about here on the show, links to the websites that I've mentioned, head to the show notes, go to genealogygems.tv, click podcast, and just navigate your way to the episode number that you're looking for. This episode is number, again, 83. And of course, I would love to hear from you, and there's a couple different ways to do it. You can send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Or you can leave a voicemail on the voicemail line and we'll have you here on the show. It's 925-272-4021. And keep an eye out for your email box because the new newsletter that talks about this episode being published has some fantastic tips in it. Blogger Amy Coffin wrote a post on some tips for using your digital camera. I thought it was fantastic. I emailed her and said, can I share it? And she said, of course. So I'm going to have that for you in the newsletter. Some some things I hadn't thought of that are just so sharp. So I know you're going to want to check that out. Um, if you're not a newsletter subscriber yet, just head to the website and click the subscribe button over in the left-hand corner, and we will get that out to you along with the free ebook on Google search strategies. Well, that's it for now. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.